Welcome back. Today, looking at Unit 2, and Unit 2 deals with taking the product that you in, invented, created, developed, and bringing it to the customer and making it succeed as best as possible. So here, we're looking at how do you raise a product? How do you raise a product? The formal definition on the chapter of the unit is the product development and product life cycle. So let's, let's take a look at the various components. First of all, when we look at the product development, what are we, what are we really thinking about? Well, we're really thinking about innovation. Innovation is coming up with new ideas to bring new products to the marketplace. Many businesses, many successful, all successful businesses create new products because essentially the customers are always demanding something that is better suited to meet their needs. And as needs change, products will need to change. So, what is it that companies do in order to bring new products to market? Well, first of all, we, we think about this concept of innovation. And innovation really comes in two formats. The first is a, an evolutionary type innovation where products are always improved. This is called continuous innovation. So, for example, the automobile. If we look at the automobile, you know, you can think back to the Model T Ford, which is a pretty basic car. And you can think of the most modern car today. And you ask yourself, well, fundamentally, the thing is the same. It has four wheels, it has an engine, be it electric or, or gas powered, and a transmission, and some system to transfer the power to the wheels, a brake pedal, gas pedal, steering wheel, gear shift. All of those features are the same on the most new car and the Model T. However, how those components work how efficient the car is, the car's ability uh, to be comfortable, luxurious, uh, look pretty, have all been improved over the course of the last hundred years of the car's life. So this is a classic example of continuous innovation. We also have something called discontinuous innovation, and discontinuous innovation is when we get brand new products. I remember, for example, growing up, we all had cassette tapes. And cassette tapes went in cassette players to play your favorite track. Then, in the beginning of the 1980s, out comes the CD. And CD meant that that tape player that we had was obsolete, and we had to use a new method in order to play music, the CD player. Now, CDs are obsolete, and they're replaced with MP4, 5, files that are played on a computer. So again, the CD has become obsolete. This is what we know, what we, it is a form of innovation, but the product is used very differently in order to do the same thing. A cassette tape, a CD, and an electronic file. This is discontinuous innovation. The problem with discontinuous innovation is that people have to buy new stuff in order to, to use it. So it has a what's called a high switching cost. In other words, people need to throw out all their old stuff and buy new stuff. Now granted, you know, it, it has brought it along. It's a much better product today than it was many years ago. But it has required people to learn new skills, buy new products, uh, basically change their music library. And, and this, this is a real problem with discontinuous innovation. So let's assume that your, your, your product is fairly innovative, it comes out, that don't mean it's necessarily going to survive in the marketplace. The marketplace is a terrible spot for, for products. Eat, eat products alive. And we think about why products fail as a good way to think about why products succeed. You know, what is it makes a successful product? One of the ways we can do that is look at well, what is it that, that makes products not successful. Well, we think about simple stuff like not enough potential buyers. How many people are out there looking for a product that holds clothes on a clothesline now? You know, the, the, the fact is that clotheslines are relatively obsolete compared to 30 or 40 years ago. So that there may not be enough people wanting to buy a new type of clothespin. Um, we also have to ask ourselves, 
how much different or improved is this product over the last product? Let's assume, for example, let's go back to the cassette tape and the CD. Uh, one of the problems with cassette tapes is they used to wear it. I know I had some tapes that I wore it. The grand thing about the CD was that you could never wear a CD out. You could break it, sure enough. But effectively, where there was no physical contact, the CD would play a thousand times and it would not be sound any different than it did the first time. That was not true for cassette tapes. So I saw a significant difference. And a reason to buy a CD was that no tape hiss, it lasted, it, it didn't skip. All these features that a CD brought to the market that the previous products before it suffered from. The CD eliminated that. So the CD sold uh, despite the fact that you had my new equipment, it sold. We also think about poor product quality. The, the number one killer for any product out there is when you bring it out to the market and it's a poor quality. The um, many instances in uh, the history of cars, for example, where a brand new car was brought onto the market. Back in the 1950s, Ford brought the Edsel. The Edsel was a um, it was a monumental leap in terms of cars. For example, the gear shift was push buttons. You'd push a button. Unfortunately, the quality of the Edsel was very poor. And it didn't take long before the people who bought the Edsels realized that they bought themselves in lemons. It didn't take long for Ford to pull the Edsel from the marketplace. So, you know, it, poor product quality kills products. And, and the inverse is high quality products do very well. Uh, products that are not sold in enough places, uh, if customers can't buy the product, it's very hard for it to get picked up into the marketplace. So you need to be able to have a good distribution system for your product. If a product requires that many people can buy it in many places, it needs to be available in many places. Poor timing. Um, the classic example is when you bring a product out for a given season at the end of the season. But let's think about you've just found a, a, a great toy. It was a great toy, but the problem is you launch it on January 1st. Well, everybody knows that toys are bought for Christmas. If you bring a product out after Christmas is done, the sales of that product will not be as good as they could have been had it been brought out in July, August, September. So timing is a critical thing for products. It, it ensures that and certain products are more susceptible to timing as well, so we need to be, be very careful on that. The core part of this unit, however, looks at the issue of strategically bringing a product to market. What do successful companies do in order to enhance the probability of a product being successful? So we're going to look next at the strategic process for bringing a new product to market. Let's take a look. The first stage of the new product development process, we call it, is the idea generation. Now the great thing is that whenever you have products in the marketplace, someone is going to tell you, hey, we can improve it. That either comes from inside your company or from outside your company. So you have internal sources of information and external sources of information that comes in that basically says, here's how your product can be improved, here are some ideas for new products, here are things you can do differently. So idea generation is really the, the crux of the start of the process. A new idea is created. Now, how can we bring that to market? So companies need to seek ideas. Once we get the idea generated, okay, we're, we're going to create a whole pile of good ideas. A whole pile of them. We can't bring everything to market. It would just be too expensive. So what we need to do is filter it somehow or another. So the rest of this process is really involving a filtering process. So we've got a host of ideas. What do we do next? Well, the next thing we need to do is screen those ideas. We have to ask ourselves as a company, which ideas have the best chance of success? And this is what the screening process is all about. So we think about things like strategic fit. Is this a product for us? Caterpillar, for example, make tractors. If someone came with a fantastic idea for a new car that Caterpillar could make, they'd have to ask themselves, are we in the car business? Is that the type of business we are in? If the answer is no, then Caterpillar is probably going to say, no, 
we're going to take our energy and focus on tractors. Uh, sticking to their knitting, more or less. So a lot of companies will look at products and say, this is a good product fit for us, or this is not such a good product fit for us. They're only going to develop the products that are relatively good fit for them. We also need to think about profit potential. Companies are going to look at all new product ideas and say, how much can we make on this? Is it going to cost more than what we can make? Is the market big enough for it? So initial screening really looks at these basic issues of can we make money on it. Once we get a product through that initial first screen, we need to continue screening by looking at developing the concept further. So it's an idea, now we need to take the idea to some degree of reality. But once we get the concept relatively straight in away, we need to come up with a, a more of a marketing plan for the product now. So we need some uh, strategy development, how we're going to bring that product to market. What, what is the plan here? How are we going to do that? So what is the product going to be used for? Who are the potential customers for the product? How much should the product cost? Um, where will we sell the product? All those things need to be thought, thought about next. Some products will get screened out at this stage because they might be just too complicated to sell. It requires so much training, or it requires so much time, or it requires so much energy that people will never buy it. So we need to be careful at this stage to figure out how can we get a product to the market as quickly and as simply as possible. From the development stage, from that market strategy stage, one of the outcomes of that is to take a look at budgets. How much is it going to cost? So the, the next stage in any product development stage looks at the concept of budgeting. How much is it going to cost to develop this product? How much are we going to potentially sell? What is the potential price we're going to sell it at? And essentially, will we make more on it than it costs to develop it? Back in the 1960s, Boeing had this exact same problem. Um, they were challenged with building a airliner that was larger than anything that had ever been built, the 747. We're all familiar with the 747, it has the characteristic hump on it. And the idea that Boeing had was to be able to create an airplane that had twice the capacity of any existing airliner, and also um, be able to carry freight. One of the big advantages of that type of design with the, the hump was that you could put a lot of room in the cabin because the, the people that flew the plane sat above the cargo. So the 747 was really designed as a cargo plane as much as a passenger plane. It cost Boeing a fortune to develop that. And they, they estimated that the market for it was less than a thousand airplanes. The cost of development was just shy of a thousand airplanes. So it was a, when they started developing and did the business modeling on that 747 design, it was really a marginal type of product. Uh, Boeing bet that they could make money on it though and they went ahead with that despite the fact that the business analysis said that you know this is questionable this is not really a, a, a guaranteed way to make money. Once we get the budget uh, looked at as a go or no go decision making tool uh, the next thing we need to do is actually start developing the product and this is where we're working into the concept of prototyping. Prototyping means you build a first copy I have um, some examples here of new product processes and I'll put some links into it to the, the relatively new 787 Dreamliner which Boeing has made and um, I, I show you some of the problems they had with it and some of the teething issues they had with it. The, the fact that it was a, um, a design that was different than any other airplane because the 787 is made of plastic more than any other plane and it's not relying on traditional means of construction but new means of construction which added to the uncertainty and it was a very, a very good example of discontinuous innovation and now that the 787 is at the marketplace we can see that it is relatively paying off for Boeing um, as in the next generation of airline so uh, I've got some links into that and you can take a look at those so we've got our prototype on the market, and our prototype now has to go out for market testing. Market testing means that people are actually going to try it. So if you're selling airplanes, executives from the airlines are going to have to actually try that plane. If you're selling cars, 
you're going to bring it out and you're going to show it to um, auto writers, um, test drivers. It won't hit the consumer necessarily, but it will certainly hit people who are in the know with regards to that industry. And they're going to look at it and they're going to say, hey, you know, this is not right or this is works great. Once a product is right for the market, then it moves into what's called commercialization. Commercialization means it hits the market. It's available for sale. So we can actually go and buy the product. Now that's a tremendous effort too because you can imagine that companies need to do a tremendous amount of marketing, tremendous amount of information has to be brought out to the customer. And if the product is a brand new product and it's a, a, a discontinuous innovation, not only do you have to tell customers that the product is available, you also would have to tell them what the product is for, what the product does, and why it is so much better than any other product that's out in the marketplace. So you have to educate customers to the general concept of the product first, then sell them the product, which makes the marketing effort that much more intense. The next major issue that we're looking at in this unit is the issue of the product life cycle. And I wanted to make sure that you were absolutely aware of the product life cycle. I'll, I'll just put up a graphic here now of what the product life cycle is and I'll just go through it. Essentially the product life cycle looks at how the sales of the product go over the life of the product. So if we look at a product we can basically break its life down into four sections. The first section deals with the very, very initial entry into the marketplace. Okay, This is called the introduction stage. Nobody knows about it. We have to garner a market. We have to get communications out there. We have to get our marketing effort out there. And eventually people will say, oh yeah, that's a neat product. I'm going to buy it. Some people will come on board to buy it much faster than other people. But those initial buyers will be the ones that are most important to getting the subsequent buyers. So in the introduction stage, you're spending a tremendous amount of time, effort, energy marketing this product. You're not making any money on it though because of the costs involved in getting people familiar with it. Once we get through introduction, the product is introduced and a lot of people get familiar with it, we move into what's called the growth stage. Now the growth stage is really the money maker stage. It's the spot where the company starts making money on the product and that sales of the product are improving and increasing. This growth stage could last a long time or a short time depending on the type of product it is. High learning products where people are slow to pick up on it have a very long growth stage. Low learning products where people figure it out fairly quickly and uh, you know they, they go buy it, it's relatively inexpensive, a number of factors come into play. Low learning products have a very short growth stage. But our growth stage then starts to bring us up to what we call the peak or maturity stage. The maturity stage is when your product is well established on the market. There's lots of competitors out there. Competitors have seen that you're making money on it and everyone's coming to the fray and you've got a lot of competition in the maturity stage. The product is pretty well saturating the market. At, at the point that it becomes saturated, the market becomes saturated with the product, meaning everyone who wants one has one you'll see sales start to peak and drop off and we move into what's called the decline stage. Now companies do not like the decline stage. The decline stage is when your profits start to lag. And we really need to get concerned at that stage. So what do we do? Well, normally we want to keep the decline stage away as far as possible or as long as possible. But if the decline stage ha starts happening, we have to make some choices. We say, well, what do we do with this product now that we're in decline? And if you look at the decline stage, the decline stage really says, okay, uh, we can come up with some basic options. Get rid of the product altogether. Delete it. If nobody's buying it anymore, it's obsolete, get rid of it. That's a delete option. The other option is that just let it slide. That's called harvest, which is just making money on it and, and basically it is a cash cow. It's coming in, it's, the money is coming in from it, people are buying it. Yeah, they're starting to decline. Eventually we'll, we'll delete the product, but for now we'll just let it make money for us. Finally, we have another option that a lot of companies choose where they say, okay, look, the product is still selling. We're not making a lot of money on it, but enough money to keep it from being pulled off the market. Let's give it to another company to make. 
and let's take our production facilities and make something new. So this is called uh, contracting out. And normally this happens a lot in uh, where uh, uh, products here in the first world get sold in the third world. So for example, um, cars. If a car is going out of production here, a, a certain design of car, uh, you know, the company might say, well, what we'll do is we'll sell the rights to make it to our subsidiary in India or our subsidiary in China. And basically they, they start making that car in India and China where there's less competition, less of a demand for the newest and the greatest. And that continues the life of that product a little bit further somewhere else in the world. You want to be very familiar with the life cycle process. It is something certainly that has appeared on exams on the past and something that uh, will probably appear there in the future.